it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. That's like the theme of 2020 is how responsive to change can you be? How do you let go of fear and around let go of expectation of how you imagine things going? As soon as we could let go of the fact that this was supposed to be our first million dollar year and say, our job is to just show up. And we have to believe that between our tenacity, our capability, um, and our willingness to like adapt, that that will be enough to carry us through. And if it's not, then we probably don't deserve to be a business. You are the factor. Welcome to The Factor. I'm your host, Sonny Mayuba. I'm a founder who's experienced gut-wrenching failure and the glory of taking a startup idea from napkin to NASDAQ. Now I work with Sparrow Ventures. We invest in the things that make life worth living with a focus in three key areas, well-being, work and purpose, and human connection. We invest in founders who are building a future we all want to live in, generational companies that have purpose at its core and can scale. I'm so excited about today's guest, meet Bethany Iverson. Others talk, Bethany does it. She quit her job, coalesced four female founders, and took a radical startup idea to reality. And today, you'll learn how she did it and how they've reacted as a company in the face of change for 2020. I have a ton of questions for Bethany, so let's dive in. Bethany, welcome. You are the factor. Hi, Sunny. It's so good to be here. Thank you for having me. All right. For those who don't know, what is The Coven and what is your mission? Yeah. So The Coven is a network of communities and workspaces um, designed around the experiences of women, non-binary, and trans folks. Our mission is to create physical and psychological safety for people who have probably never felt it professionally uh, in their lives. And we knew that the experiences that we had of feeling like there had to be more, um, that we weren't being taken professionally or taken as seriously as, as we deserve to be, we, we just had this hunch that like, it wasn't just us, you know, just people working in advertising who were experiencing this. And so I think the idea to women like us didn't seem radical. And then I think there's a lot of people who just couldn't quite wrap their heads around why do women non-binary and trans people need their own space? Questions ranging as far as, is this discriminatory to create a brave space that's really centered around what women need? And so again, I think there are, you know, some Midwest cultural norms that definitely shaped the response that we had. And that's really where, and we can talk about this more, but I think that's a big part of why our social mission was an important important component of the business to kind of make it feel like it's not, it's not just a thing that is, you know, a sort of for our own gain, but it's really to change the way that we all work through a lens of, of what do women need first. So when you think back to, you know, you're, you're in one of the ad capitals of the world. And you think back to having this great career, you know, like you said, climbing the corporate ladder, uh, great jobs, probably, you know, awesome, steady paychecks. Share a personal experience that that happened to you that made you say, this is bullshit. I have to go start this. What, what happened? Oh, and I, I think a lot of a lot of women and men too. I mean, I think men often get left out of of these stories of like men experience harassment and assault in very similar ways to women, and we don't talk about it enough. So I want to name that first. But in in the instance that was sort of like the last straw for me was you know the um, my boss at the agency that I was at at the time, who was had been a, a really strong mentor to me and was someone I really looked up to. He had sent an insane drunken email at 2.45 in the morning to myself and a few other um, younger female employees at the agency that was just, I mean, explicit and disgusting. And he happened to copy the president of the agency and the chief creative officer on that email as well. And so the next day he was let go. And it was not, I mean, the agency responded as well as they possibly could have. And he was let go. And, you know, I have not spoken with him since. But that to me was like, what? the fact that someone thinks that this is normal and his response when he was, you know, called out on it by the the president was like, sorry, I was, you know, I got, I was too drunk and it was a a poor choice in judgment. And it's like the fact that, that you think that that's okay, or that it was like, you can just 
apologize and it goes away is to me unacceptable. And so that's when I knew like, you know, I knew that that leaving was the right thing to do. And I knew that I was betraying, I think my values and, and who I believed I could be um, to stay in this comfortable environment, as you described with, you know, a cushy paycheck and, and all of the trappings of like a comfortable agency <laughs> life. So do you think that the coven and the work that you do, have you seen firsthand that it's affected, you know, other women or, or like you said, men, other people who are in, you know, situations of abuse or like, like what you, what you were experiencing? Absolutely. And we, we think about the coven as like, it's a, a great space to start your next chapter or heal from your last. There's a lot of people who, men and women, who have a dream and a vision and something that they want to build. And they've probably just never been around, you know, the right influences to, to really help them take that leap. And so we think a lot about like, how do we help our members create and find a stronger bias for action and risk taking? And we believe that again, that psychological safety, when you feel like you have the right resources when you feel like there's an army of people cheering you on it's so much easier to leap and so that's like i i bet you know the majority of our members have some kind of a story like that where they're looking for something bigger and they just maybe haven't found it elsewhere 2020 has been a challenging year for everybody on this call for everybody in the world our theme that we've been rallying behind at sparrow has been never give up something that's very close to my heart as well so how have you dealt with 2020 and what has been your theme to get through? <laughs> okay, I'm going to swear. I hope that's okay. You can that's beat fine. out if you Hey, it's the internet. Do what you want. Oh my God. <laughs> well, our theme has kind of been fuck it, we'll do it live for better or worse, which is, which was proven to be hold like- on, Hold on, hold on, hold yeah. on. Your theme has been what? Fuck it, we'll do it live. Okay, uh, explain that. Explain that. Well, Unfortunately, it's actually something that Bill O'Reilly said, which is like a terrible, like he's Ooh. not a great person that you want <laughs> on your reference list. But it basically just means like all the plans, you know, the plans are out the window. Nothing is going the way that we think it's going to. So like, let's just get into it and like, we'll just figure it out. You know, you just, you pivot, <laughs> you just pivot. But Sunny, actually, so you had, I don't know if you remember this. Hmm. Sunny had given a talk when I was in San Francisco in fall. <laughs> yeah, I remember, okay, I remember I that. Yes. A talk when I was in this accelerator, um, and it's uh, on the screen, which you probably can't see, is a quote from Charles Darwin, which is, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. And that, I mean, that quote, like, I think we're all probably familiar with some version of that quote, but I really think that's like, the theme of 2020 is how responsive to change can you be? Um, and so we have found at the center of this crazy year, and we can talk more about the different elements of craziness that have unfolded, um, but how do, you, how do you let go of fear and around let go of expectation of how you imagine things going? Um, you cannot out hustle a pandemic. You can't do it. You can't work harder than a pandemic. And so for us, as soon as we could let go of the fact that this was supposed to be our first million dollar year and say our job is to just show up for our community and for our members in the way that we think will be of the most service and we have to believe that between our tenacity our capability um, and our willingness to like adapt that that will be enough to carry us through and if it's not then we probably don't deserve to be a business and so that was kind of the approach that we took pretty early on in maybe like the middle to end of March. And it's just been sort of the, the theme that we've been working with ever since. In speaking about the change and the challenges of 2020, you're a startup, you have tech, you have physical space, you have an HQ, just like most of the founders here watching this. Your physical space and your tech and your startup happens to be in Minneapolis, you know, right at the core where the George Floyd murder happened. So Tell us, as a, as a startup founder, what was it like being there when the incident happened, and how has it been since? Yeah, and I don't know if, if anyone else is, is in the Midwest or if folks are mostly out on the West Coast here. Um, and first, I should just say that the Coven, you know, is probably an anti-racist organization. We are stand firmly of the belief that Black lives have always and will always matter. Um, those are not controversial statements for us. And so, you know, we believe we're a, an organization that's built around racial and gender equity. And so for us, you know, 
while the events around the murder of George Floyd were obviously heartbreaking, I think it was also, we felt like we were being called to be of service in, in just a really different way. And it's, you know, it is a profound feeling. And I, I know that uprisings happened in almost every city around the country. But to walk through, you know, neighborhoods that you've known and loved for 20 years and just see them burnt to the ground is a truly a life-changing experience. And so I think we felt immediately in the day or two after George Floyd was killed and there was, you know, the uprisings were, were starting here in, in Minneapolis, we just felt like we needed to show up for our community. And because we had a physical space that was closed due to a pandemic, we were able to turn it into one of our locations into an emergency distribution center. So we partnered with a really cool organization in Minneapolis called Women for Political Change. And we essentially became a drop site for donations. We funneled hundreds of thousands of dollars of goods to different neighborhoods in need that, in need that had become food deserts overnight. We sent you know, thousands of carloads over a period of about five weeks to these different centers. And it, it was not, we couldn't do it forever, right? Because it's not our business model. We had to deploy our staff. We were just getting ready to, to reopen our physical spaces after being closed for quarantine. And so we're working on figuring out how we continue that work moving forward. But we just we just showed up and, you know, we had dozens of volunteers every day who would show up alongside us. And I think when that kind of a thing happens, everyone feels helpless and everyone wants to make it better. And so you just try to figure out what's the little what's the little role that I can play in this. And then you do it to the best of your ability. So let's talk a little bit about the business. You, you know, you have a physical space with membership. Um, you talked about that in the beginning here. And obviously, you've got an online community you've built. So I imagine you had to make some change with physical space. And I understand this as a business owner as well. We had, you have to close, then you're open, then you're closed. And you know, you've had to t tell us what you've had to do with the business. How's the business doing? Did you have to, you know, re, re, uh, reproject revenues? Did you do layoffs? Did you do hiring? What have you done with the business and what's going on? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you know, it's a lot and it feels like every day um, it, I could have a, a different answer of what I think will happen next too. So. You know, we closed um, in Minneapolis, things shut down mid-March, um, which is unfortunately right after our grand opening for our second location, which is a beautiful space in St. Paul, Minnesota. We had been already working with a really lean team. In fact, we were just getting ready to make a few significant hires. And so that all went on hold. And basically overnight, we figured out how to create an online offering. Um, so we are a, a co-working space, a shared workspace, but we also do a ton of professional development through events, programming, workshops, connections. So a lot of that could translate online. We had just never had the time or energy to, to really get it off the ground. And so this kind of forced our hand in that way, which was, you know, maybe a silver lining that might be, might be a generous description, um, but it forced us to get things up and running online. And again, as people are dealing with feelings of isolation, right? As we're watching moms try to, and dads try to navigate both owning businesses, being employees, having their little ones at home with them. We could just sense that like people needed both joyful things that gave them hope and opportunities to vent and just feel like they could relate to people who were going through something really similar. So we pivoted everything online. We grew our online community to about 500 uh, people in just a few weeks. And we didn't lay anyone off because we had a really small team. All the founder salaries did get cut to zero, which is, you know, I mean, Sunny, you've been in that position before. It's like, you just sure do have. It's the right thing to do. And it's the only thing to do. And if I have to pick between, you know, firing my general manager who has been with us for two and a half years or me taking zero, I'll take zero um, and figure it out. So we did that, obviously got, you know, knee deep in all of the SBA programs and there's a ton of small business grants as I'm sure we've all been, you know, spending hours and hours chasing those. So yeah, so you just kind of like do everything you can to, to keep the ship afloat. We did project to lose about half of our revenue for the year, um, which is not like, it doesn't feel great, but our gate, yeah. you know, if we can, I think for us, it's like if we can make it through the next 10 to 12 months, our business will be more relevant than ever. And so that's sort of the game that we're playing. It's the game that we all play, right? Is like, don't run out of money. <laughs> that's right. Never uh, give up. <laughs> yeah. Never yeah. Don't, up. don't die. My favorite quote, don't die. How about that? <laughs> you, yeah. You once said, do anything to stay alive. You know, do anything to stay alive. That's right. Alive. And I think that that's like, 
we're, we are all probably resourceful enough to figure out how to do that for 10 or 12 months. So um, it's going to be a lean year for sure. But I think, again, like we believe in the vision. We believe that what we're, what we've created is really needed. Um, we're looking at amplifying our work through different partnerships and new revenue streams in response to what's happening. Um, so we're just, we're being creative and we're being entrepreneurial. You know, I think probably I'm guessing what all of us are doing in our, in different ways, right? You said something interesting. COVID forced your hand to innovate the business is what you really said, right? You, you, it would all, it had always been on your roadmap to move the community online. It was a physical space community forced you to, to innovate. Do you think companies are doing that fast enough? Are entrepreneurs doing that fast enough? Is there more you can do to use this time to innovate? Yeah, you know, I think, I think it's, it's, it's tricky because you want to both like, you want to take a little bit of time to be really strategic and thoughtful and actually create solutions to problems that people have. And you also want to be immediately responsive and show up. And so I think those two things are, are often at odds. So we've taken, you know, a test and learn approach where we are, we're piloting a bunch of stuff and saying, let's run this three or five times and just see if this event is well attended. Let's try to bring in these types of guests and just see how that works. Um, let's try to partner with these types of organizations and see where that nets us. So we're really doing this in the spirit of experimentation and in the spirit of learning, knowing that we're not going to probably get it right on the first try, but you gotta, like, you gotta work. <laughs> There's another thing that I really like. I'm going to swear again. If you're going to eat shit, don't nibble. And I think that that's just like, <laughs> I love it. You got to get in there. You just got to get in there and try stuff out and see what works and what doesn't. And so, so that's very much been our approach for the last, you know, four going on five months now. <laughs> that's great. Isn't that you good? Some, you, no, that's, that's great. You, you got some themes for this year. Like you said, you had some ideas, you put together a team, you were building what you thought was just a small business. Turns out you're building this really cool startup in the modern era and you went out to do fundraising and raise from venture capitalists and all that kind of good stuff. Tell us about your experience with fundraising and what advice do you have for not just entrepreneurs, but specifically female entrepreneurs out fundraising? You know, and it, we, we entered the, the kind of like fundraising market at a really interesting time. So it would have been January of, of 2019 when, you know, uh, VCs were writing checks, you know, it was easy to get money. Um, fundraising was not hard, I think, uh, for many, for many startup founders. And I will tell you, like, we are first time founders. We are four women, three of us are white, one of us is black. So that is, you know, there are obviously like there are racial disparities at play here as well. We had never raised money from anyone, let alone venture capitalists before. Again, we had all had careers in advertising where it was like, we were designing menus, we weren't eating food. And so we were now gonna start the process of we now have to figure out how to do this. And so we worked with some really wonderful advisors who helped us like even get the language of like, what you're doing is a pre-seed round. And we were like, what's a pre-seed round? You know, <laughs> that? And so we quickly built that muscle just through a lot of like really intensive study. We, we worked with a really incredible um, woman named Janice Frazier out in San Francisco. Um, and one of her business partners, Melissa Moore, who run a kind of like pre-seed incubator specifically for, for female founders. We worked with them to like help get our pitch deck tight, to help us understand like how do you even fundraise? And we just started talking to, frankly, the wealthy people in our network because we thought like, well, we can cobble together a million bucks from $50,000 checks. And, you know, we had a slow kind of first few months and then eventually it took off and we started getting, you know, you start, you get your first $250,000 check and you're like, oh shit, like we might actually be doing this. Like, oh my God. Um, and so while I would say it certainly, it took us longer than I think it probably would have if we were like a tech startup. Um, we did, we, you know, we were doing it. And then I was actually in San Francisco in Jason Calacanis's accelerator. He's another one of those people that has profoundly just changed my life. And, and I, I have so much regard for, for him and the work that he does, but I was in his accelerator this fall and the WeWork IPO just fell apart. Um, and immediately, I mean, overnight, the checks stopped. And um, we were at a point of growing the business. I think oftentimes founders of startups are given this narrative that like, your job is to grow, you're gonna lose money the first five years and your job is to just grow, 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 grow so that you can sell. And then WeWork happened for us and 
overnight it was like, that's not, that model actually doesn't work. And Jason Calacanis, bless his heart, is someone who's very oriented around create a business that performs. And Sunny, you know this too, like create a business that performs, do the work, put up the numbers, and you either won't need to take on investors or investors will be beating down your door to write checks. And so we pivoted in late 2019 to just say we have to make the business perform and and be successful on its own we had gotten about three quarters of the way through a 1.2 million dollar round and we were like well let's let's just figure it out let's put our heads down and and get to work Um, and that's kind of what we did Uh, so it was not easy it was it was exciting it was interesting it was incredibly educational we'll raise money again probably in a a year because we do have a big vision of of what we can become Um, but yeah it was Woo! It was crazy. Was that? Were, did you have? You had a, maybe a bit of a different experience, huh? Because you've always you've kind of been in. Not too different. Not too different. Really? Not, not too different. No, not too different. And you know, we'll, we'll do a virtual coffee, and I'll tell you all my story because that could take us like sixteen hours. I talk a lot, so but let's get back to you. So, l- tell me, Bethany. You know, again, I think the work you're doing is profound for young entrepreneurs, and I think it's really profound for young female entrepreneurs to see this. It's not as common as people think. What's your message or advice to females who want to be an entrepreneur? I think the message is probably just that like fear is a liar and it will always tell you that like, it's not safe to do the thing that you think you can do and that it's scary to step into the unknown um, and that it's not going to work. Right. Because the systems that we all are a part of um, aren't designed to show us how incredible we are and to show us everything that we're capable of. They're designed for efficiency and they're designed to get people you know, from point A to point B to point C. And so I think when you let go of fear and you just figure like, we'll figure it out or we won't. I've always, <laughs> this is like, I don't know, if you're a founder, you can probably relate to this. I've always said like, everything's fine as long as I don't lose my house. Like, I don't mind losing everything. I just wanna keep my house. Um, and I think that like, that's my metric. I told my friend that who's a lawyer and she was like, oh my God, like she was appalled. And I was like, I don't know, that feels good. Um, so I think- I yeah. like it. I did too. <laughs> so yeah, fear is a liar. You should find your people who make you feel strong and make you feel brave and then just do it, you know? Where life is short. You talked about something interesting. You said we have a big vision. And I, I know you and I have chatted about it before and I've seen it through your eyes, but, but what is it? What is the vision for the coven? T- tell us about it. Yeah, you know, we are obviously four women from an underdog city in the middle of the country that a lot of people don't even know where Minneapolis is on a map. And we see the incredible resources that are developed for women, non-binary and trans folks in coastal cities and in in tier one markets. Um, And we know that there is a desert for a lot of those things in these underdog cities where actually quite a huge percentage of the country's population lives. And so our vision is to bring um, spaces that create physical and psychological safety to underdog cities around the country and around the world. We believe that today that needs to be solved through a lens of you know, the future of work. Um, but we have a, a big vision of what that could mean for how we live, how we play. So today we're doing co-working spaces and I think tomorrow anything is possible. Building this digital community has been a really cool opportunity for us to get new members from around the world. We've got members in Ireland today, um, members all over the country. So it's it's allowed us to kind of get a first really small taste of, of what that could be like. And I, I just, I think that that physical and psychological safety, when we have that, everything changes. And so we, yeah, we see so many ways that that could be applied. Let's mix it up a little bit. All okay. right. So this is the time where our live audience of The Factor gets to ask you questions. So let's head on over to the Zoom chat. All right, Bethany, you ready for that? Let's do it. Okay, so I think the first question goes to James Sowers. Thanks for um, having a great show, and thanks for being here, Bethany. And my question is, um, everyone talks about the disadvantages of not being in Silicon Valley. But what are the hidden advantages? For example, less competition or lower overhead when you're going from zero to one in your market. I would have felt really unqualified to answer that question, but I had a chance to spend some time in Silicon Valley last fall, so I feel like I have a little taste of, of the difference between the two. And actually, I think, Sonny, you and Jason got into maybe a little bit of a conversation about this of like is it harder to be a founder of a startup in the midwest or is it harder in silicon valley and you know i think um 
I think access to capital is harder in the Midwest. People are, especially in Minnesota, there's a lot of wealth, but people are very, they keep it very close to their chest, right? So getting a check in Minnesota is a very hard thing to do. The cost of living in Minnesota or in, you know, an any underdog city really is so much lower. You can afford to build a team for way less money. So I think a lot of those operational things are huge advantages. For us being a more real estate intensive organization, our rent is, I mean, a fraction of what it would cost in San Francisco. So I think if you can build your network in the appropriate way, right, and have access to people from around the country, being in the an underdog theater in, in the Midwest, in our case, has actually been a, a real blessing because I think it's just given us more time to figure things out without the pressure of all of the immense expenses of being in New York or San Fran. Yeah, I'll tag on to that. We were in a very interesting conversation about this at Sparrow, and what we landed on was it's that synergy. It's that bumping elbows. You know, it's a very tight area and you pop into a cafe and you bump into, you know, your next engineer, the, the head of, you know, community at Instagram, any, you know, that happens, that happens in Silicon. That's like, to me, the real true hidden advantage. Here's the interesting thing, James, what does that look like in the era of COVID? Uh, you know, so we, that's why we've got to get past COVID to get that, you know, that synergy happening again, because I think, I think great things happen when people are in that really cool space, but you do pay rent for it. But great question. Thank you, James. Uh, our next question goes to Lynn. Lynn, go ahead and unmute and ask of Bethany Iverson anything you like. Hi, Bethany, and hi, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Sunny, for this great program. And I am a member of the Coven in St. Paul. So hi, Bethany. <laughs> hi, oh, cool. I love that you're here. That's so cool. Um, so wonderful. I want to just make one comment, and then I'll ask the question as well, is that as a person who's nearing retirement from my professional life, um, I would just say that the women's age group between 55 and 75 is a fascinating one as far as entrepreneurship is concerned, because many of us bring a lot of different skills and so on into that. So I'm looking at that as well. But my question is, a quote that I've taken on as an entrepreneur myself is, you can't take two leaps over a chasm. And when you said, Bethany, um, if you're going to eat shit, don't uh, nibble, I thought, I think you just probably answered my question, but, and a lot of your examples, but can you share any experiences um, either in the startup or currently in which you and your founders had to take just this kind of giant leap? And what were the risks or what more were the characteristics or attitudes that you had to have in order to 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 go for the whole thing, to take the giant leap to get over the chasm. Awesome. Lynn, again, thank you so much for being here. It's so good to see you. I've, I've missed you. Lynn is a, a member in our St. Paul space, as she said, and so I'm used to seeing her weekly, and it's obviously not been that way for, for some months, so it's really good to, to have you here. You know, I think oftentimes things that feel like they would be terrifying to do alone, when you do them with people that you love and people that you trust, they just feel like an adventure. And so a lot of a lot of the the moments of the last, you know, four months, frankly, that would have probably, I've thought about this actually, like, if I was the sole founder of the coven, I would have shut the business down. I mean, probably like, it probably would have never even existed, right? But when you have other people who in your lowest moments are the ones who are riding high, like that is what you need to do things that seem and feel impossible. And I think, um, I don't know how sole founders do it. Honestly, I have so much respect for you. Um, I think it is, I, I can't imagine how like challenging it would be to start something on your own. Um, but for me, like those moments, Lynn, that have felt impossible have been made possible because of the people that I, I own a business with. And typically what we always think is like, one of us either has the right idea, the right resource, the right connection to make this problem doable, to make it workable. And, and we kind of go, you know, go from there. Our third question is from, ooh, my dear friend and fellow COO now, uh, Bob Miller. What's going on, Sonny? Hello, Bethany. Hi. Hey, but by the way, I got to tell you something. When he says that he does talk a lot, the man is not, he's not really giving it the epic under, it's an epic under, <laughs> but it's always good stuff. I will say that it's always extremely meaningful. So my, my question is a couple of, well, there's a couple of things. One is I think it was actually a gift that you had to pivot to online. 
because I can see the future potential for what it is the, you know, your mission is and, and, and what it's going to mean to you long term. So I think that was actually a gift and should be kind of viewed that way, to be honest with you, because you're, you're going to be able to go worldwide right off the bat, right? That makes a big difference as far as your addressable market goes. So. And my question is, is what kind of what kind of innovation, what process for innovation do you use when you guys are vetting? You know, when you sit down and you're trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to do next? Do you have an innovation process and what is it? What, what do you use? What kind of tactics do you use? Yeah, Bob Miller, thanks for that question. Um, you've got one of those names that you have to say the first and last name every time. Um, <laughs> I love that. So, yes, I agree. I think like the, you know, the online community is blessing in disguise and we've got some work to do. We're sort of in the MVP of that. So we're, we've got some uh, big ideas about what that can become. But in terms of process, you know, it's maybe... I wish I had a, like a, a more exciting answer for you, but we use EOS. I don't know if you're familiar with Traction. It's like a, an entrepreneurial operating system. Yeah, Sonny, you, like, you use EOS too, don't you? Oh, yeah. Um, so we, we've used that since day one, and that gives us a great operational framework of, of what we're doing and where we're going and, and helping us understand why. Um, myself and one of my business partners, Liz Giel, also have really deep backgrounds in market and consumer research. And so for us, we just always think about who can we talk to to understand if this idea is good or bad um, or if it's needed or not, probably more importantly. And so we do a lot of listening. We operate on a test and learn framework where we just know that like we treat everything like an experiment that we're going to run for a month or three months. Um, and then we're going to evaluate it and see. And if it's working, great, let's keep going. And if it's not, let's walk away from it with no judgment, right, about being right or wrong. And I think those sort of like simple things put together. So using traction, um, talking with our, our customers and our members and treating things like an experiment have helped us kind of pivot and iterate really fast. EOS is entrepreneur entrepreneurial operating system, entrepreneur operating system. You can really get that from a couple of resources, the book Traction, another book, What the Heck is EOS? And then EOS Worldwide Online. EOS Worldwide will give you kind of a, a framework into it. But it's really about, you know, having effective level 10 meetings, you know, laddering up to rocks, quarterly goals. It's a lot like, you know, OKRs, but even more robust. That's a great system. So we have another question. This one is from Nico Posner. Nico in the house. This is a good one. Be, be prepared, Bethany. This one's going to stump you, I think. Nico, you have the podium. Take it away. Uh, my question is, uh, how much is what the Coven does is brand new or mirrored from other organizations in other areas of the country that try to accomplish similar goals and solve similar needs? The second question is, like, how much are you creating this purely on your own or how much are you leveraging knowledge and resources from, from other uh, startups or other organizations? So Nico, I think you might be referencing organizations like The Wing um, or The Riveter, which recently closed down that had some West Coast presence. You know, I would say it's a combination of, of both. Frankly, like when you solve a problem for underdog markets, the mechanics are just gonna look a little bit different than they do in tier one cities. So there are socioeconomic things that are different. There are, you know, professional things that are different. So culturally, there are just differences that will impact the way that you shape the business. But the idea of like, what do women, non-binary and trans people need in a physical space? I think a lot of that you could look at, at other femme forward shared workspaces and say like, it's a parent and prayer room, right? It's a shower area. Um, it's a beauty room where they can get ready. Like, a lot of those things are kind of can be, I think, a little bit more turnkey or, or feel more copy and paste. But I think the cultural and um, kind of like, yeah, the cultural challenges of underdog markets are, are pretty different and largely for us around socioeconomic and race, frankly. Um, and so those are challenges that, that we try to solve kind of with our an original lens to really address the issues that are a part of our city and a part of the markets where we want to play. Camilla Olson, unmute. You have the mic. Hi, Bethany. We met at launch last fall. I remember meeting you. How are you? All right. Nice to see you again. Great to hear you here. Hey, I have a question for you when you were telling your story. You know, they say it takes something like six or eight pivots to get, you know, from here to there. Um, I like to say, well, there's a corollary of the phrase, um, you have to show up to get laid. So you... <laughs> We've got yeah, some, oh, to... this is a great session. We've got like three killer one-liners. Sorry, keep going, Camilla. 
So you have, you got to stay in the game. You have to stick with your company, right, to get through. So I, I love the theme of, um, of Sphero, never give up, because you can't give up or you'll never get there. So I know you've maybe had a couple pivots. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could count them and maybe tell us what they were. There's, I'm going to give you another one-liner, Sunny, uh, which you can do whatever you want with. It doesn't have any swear words in it. Um, but the middle of anything looks like failure. And so I think, you know, so often when you feel like, oh, like it's never, we're never going to have, we're not ever going to have a million dollar year. We're not ever going to have 2000 members. It's like, of course we will. If we keep going, we of course will do those things. So we have to not stop. Um, and I think like, in those moments where you want to give up, you got to figure out like, how are you going to just get to the other side of it? So I would say our first pivot probably came around fundraising when it was like, we're just going to make the business work. And we're just going to really figure out on how to um, figure out how to grow the business on, you know, sales and, and hustle. And then I think the, the next big one was for sure when we had to shut down our physical spaces um, and go online. And now this new one is, is really figuring out like, we believe that our work around racial and gender equity are of huge value to big companies and corporations that are desperate to figure out how to solve these problems. And, and we really think that ourselves powered by our community have something to mm -hmm. offer. So this is a new area that we're exploring while, while our physical spaces just can't do the thing that they're designed to do. Um, and so that's maybe the, the third pivot. And I'm sure, ask me in a year and I'll probably have pivots like four through eight for you. That's phenomenal. And, and the big lesson in there, Bethany, is you're still here. I think a lot of founders, and look, I was guilty of this in my early, early years. You have a vision and you see the vision down the road. We're going to be big. And then life changes, the world changes. And if you don't change with it, then you're dead and you gotta you gotta kind of fall unloved un in love with your with your vision and understand that you can get to the vision in a windy road and you're still here so that's pretty awesome we have another question and i want to make sure that i get it get it in uh jaya shri take the mic and drop some knowledge yeah um thank you so much sunny and bethany and your entire team for being here um jay shri so i mean you were pretty close jay shri, um, cool. My question was more focused towards this COVID pivot. Oh, there's a there's a huge focus on innovating and just figuring out what we can do. And you talked about your pivot and what a lot of other companies are trying to pivot to. And my question is, what if your pivot is leading you away from the value, um, from your core value proposition? And I found that in our COVID pivot, I've lost a little bit of that of that value that we originally intended to provide, and I'm wondering if that I don't I don't know I'm wondering if that's the right way to go. And so that's yeah. Could you speak to that? Yeah, Jay Jay Shri, thanks for sharing that. I think it can be really hard to talk about the stuff that we struggle with, right? We always, as entrepreneurs, I think are wired to be optimists, and so it's so easy to paint the picture of of all the things that like we're learning and we're doing it right. And, and the reality is, is that there are like some heartbreaking setbacks probably that, that come alongside all of that. So thank you for sharing that. I, I really appreciate you being honest. You know, I think the, the saving grace for us in all of this, like we, we've always envisioned being a physical space-based business. And so the online thing, while it's great and it does a lot of stuff that we, that we wouldn't have been able to do, it's not a part of the, um, you know, the, the central part of the vision that we had. And so I, I can relate to what you're saying, I think, in, in some ways for sure. I think it's been helpful for us to just think about this in terms of a short amount of time. So we have a long view of time, which is, you know, what we think the business can be and the vision that we have to take over the world and to change how women, non-binary and trans people show up in underdog cities. And that will happen. It might take us five years. It might take us 10 years, but that will happen. And then we've got these three to 12 months right now that we have to figure out how to navigate. And the value prop might look a little bit different and it might not feel quite like what, it, um, what we want it to, but it's going to help us make sure that we can get to year five. Um, and so that is like, that's a trade-off that, you know, we're willing to make. I think when, if I felt like, oh my God, this is now the future direction of the business, I, that would, that would be a hard pill to swallow. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful for you at all, but yeah, the short view of time, like 
this pandemic, it feels, it feels like it's gone on forever, but it's not going to last forever. Right. It's not going to last forever. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. I hope that's helpful. What's your company? What do you do? Yeah. Um, so I'm actually in the process of this customer discovery and really, really early stage. And we're a platform that instantly connects people who need language and cultural help with interpreters. So almost like you'd press a button and call an Uber to get a ride, you can press a button and get connected with the interpreter. So it's kind of like democratizing that language access. Awesome. Yeah, that's a very cool concept. When you have a deck and you're ready, you send it to me, please. Thank you. Okay. (laughs) We have time for... No, thanks for coming on The Factor. We have time for one more question, and it's from Juan Juan. Is it Juan or Juan Juan? That's it, Juan Juan. Juan Juan. Okay, Juan Juan, uh, you have the mic. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Bethany and Sunny. Uh, Having gone through the launch accelerator, um, what is your advice in making the most of it? Because sometimes founders waste their time during the program. So we only got maybe three to four months. Make sure, you know, we do all the tasks and assignments what, what, what are you recommending yeah i would say just show up and every day remember that you just have three to four months so i think you know for for me um being in launch was every week it was 14 hour days um 15 oh, wow. hour days it was back-to-back meetings right i mentioned that like when we were happened and it was immediately clear that no one was going to write us checks it was continuing to take meetings with vcs and ha is actually one of the super generous people who agreed to meet with us um and was i mean just so kind and it was sort of at like a very low moment but continuing to like take meetings with people even though you know you're they're not going to write you a check um and doing the work and showing up and pitching a business that very few people were taking seriously. I think it's like, you got to keep doing it because in 10 years, are you going to look back and say, oh, that four months I had, I wish I would have done X, Y, Z differently. So every time that Jason Calacanis said I have office hours or asked me a question, you know, taking advantage of all of that, I think it's like being the nerdy kid in the class where you're like, you're not ashamed of, of how much you're going to go get because you've given up a lot of your company to have the experience. And so I think that was like, we got to make this hundred thousand dollars really, really worth it. And so that was the approach that, that I took in my business. One of my business partners was out with me for the first few weeks of the program, but yeah. And you know, it's like, you kind of just got to get in there, like get in there as deep as you can. You only get to do it once. So you might as well make it really good. You know? Yeah. I I think you nail it on the head. It's about participating and it's about, you know, it's just like being on a sports team, do a little, go to practice more often, shoot more free throws in practice than the other players. That's a great, to me, always, I thought it was a great metaphor. Participate, take meetings, uh, network, you know, show up early, stay late, do the work. It really is all about doing the work. Listen a lot. But, but here's another little secret advice. Don't listen to everything everyone's, I mean, listen to everything everyone says, but don't, it's easy to take the word as gospel because you're surrounded by these titans that are great. Not everything they say is right. They don't know everything. Remember that. You know your business better than anybody knows your business. I actually have another question for you, Bethany, which is, you know, you build a community that is online now and physical. And I think every business in the world has some sense of community, but I think most businesses literally have a community, but a community is about finding your customers. So drop some knowledge on how, on what you've learned about building a community and turning that community into customers. To be totally honest, we're probably still like early on in that, in that process. Sure. Um, I'll come back to a, the, a notion that I, that I offered earlier, which is like, we're trying to figure out how we can be of service and of value to the community that, that we serve. And so to us, it's like, we might offer, we have, 15 great ideas for programming and events that we're super excited about. But if other people aren't excited about them, then they're actually not great ideas, right? And so a lot of what we're doing um, is just trying to figure out like, can we test and learn our way to creating value over time, right? So maybe you're a member um, and you're on a really affordable membership plan for the first eight months of, of your time with us. And then finally at month eight, you feel like we've demonstrated value over and over and over again that you're going to flip and you're going to become a higher paying customer for the coven, which is great for us. And obviously it's like all businesses need need those low level people to flip eventually, right? Or you need to get more uh, higher paying customers. 
And so I think our, our job right now is to just figure out how do we create the most value and how do we bring people along that journey so that when we ask them to pay the $1,800 all at once, it feels like an obvious yes for them to do that. And so I, like I said, I, I think we're still really early on in that process. The digital programming and events is a totally different ball game for us. And Sunny, as you know, it's like, it's really hard to take something in world and translate it digitally just as effectively. And so we're working on how to do that. You know, I think we've got some strong early metrics and also some things that we can tweak to make it even better. All right, last question, really easy one. Top three favorite tools you use to run your business? Kick some knowledge for these folks. Top three okay. favorite tools. For sure, HubSpot. Um, they do, I'm sure everyone knows, but they do a super sweet startup discount. Um, if you go through an accelerator or you're a part of uh, a number of different programs, you can get like 90% off your first year and then 70% off your second year. Um, so HubSpot has changed the game for us in terms of how we manage our pipeline and, and what we're able to do from like a sales and marketing perspective. Slack is a quintessential tool for us just in terms of in communicating as a team internally. And then obviously Zoom, I mean, we wouldn't be able to do any, or I shouldn't say we wouldn't be able to, it would be much harder for us to do events and programming um, the way we've been without, without Zoom. And the Zoom gods are also, they're like blessing all the startup founders right now. They're upgrading. I know, oh. such a good move. It's such a good move. I mean, their yeah. whole announcement like, hey, we're a platform now, go ahead and build on top of us. Oh, by the way, we're blessing the startups it was so brilliant. Yeah, I know. I'm glad I have zero Zoom stock. That was really smart of me. Awesome. Damn it. <laughs> me too, Sonny. It's okay. Me it's okay. Oh my gosh. It's been so awesome having you. Um, if, if our awesome audience here wants to learn more about the coven, learn more about you, where do they go? Yeah, they can go to our website, which is www.thecoven.com. We're launching a new website in the next couple months. So hang on to your pants everybody it's gonna be a real wild ride <laughs> um <laughs> or you can find me if you want to email me my email address is bethany at thecoven.com awesome so glad all right audience thank you so much for attending episode two of the factor we did it that was good we had bethany iverson who's so great again follow the coven at at the coven co and Bethany Iverson at Bethany underscore Iverson. And you can follow me at Sunny Mayuba and at Sparrow Ventures. So be on the lookout to sign up for episode three. And for all of you who hung out this long, I appreciate you so much. Bethany, thank you for being the factor. Thank you. Until next time, stay safe, never give up. And if you're a sick company that is looking for investment, send us your deck. See you next time, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, all.